And then um, I also will mute myself and like type a couple notes while you talk. Um, so if you see me, I'm sort of looking away. I'm just looking at my computer screen so I can make sure. sure. Mm -hmm. thing. Um, but yeah, my first question is sort of an overview question, but do you wanna, oh, I guess just to confirm, is your name spelled the way it is on the screen right now? Yes. Okay. And then my first question is, do you want to maybe tell me a bit about um, what you what you and CASA are currently doing this week? Sure. Well, uh, yesterday happened to be Giving Tuesday, uh, so it was a big day in terms of uh, both fundraising and raising awareness about our program as well as others in the CASA network around the country. So that was one uh, one priority, but we're also in the middle of a training. So we're training volunteers. We have 11 in our latest cohort. Uh, this is our seventh cohort to date in the last two years that we've trained. So these are adults ranging from their 20s to around age 70 who are uh, undergoing about 30 hours of pre-service training. And then they also commit to being volunteers for a year and a half or more, whatever it takes. Uh, and then to also participating in participate in ongoing training as part of that. So those are among the priorities, but you know, it's a uh, grant reporting season, grant application season. Uh, we have a, a board of uh, 18 colleagues who were uh, terrific and a couple new members of our advisory council, which is now up to 12. So, uh, you know, there's always a lot going on for a, a small kind of startup organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that overview. And my next question more is about um, your experience and background with CASA. So you currently work as, as the director of CASA, but your journey here has been long. Um, I read some online articles in the past about you and you previously worked at Columbia, at a US representative's office and at UConn Upward Bound amongst many other positions. What brought you to found CASA South Connecticut and now work as overall director of CASA Connecticut? And what brought you to take on these positions? Well, I would say it, it's uh, a culmination of a progression that has been largely rooted in Connecticut, including in the New Haven area. And I've always enjoyed working with and on behalf of young people. So this opportunity uh, arose to, to be the founding director of what was CASA of Southern Connecticut uh, and has now become Connecticut CASA. So I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial, but still uh, in the greater New Haven community and uh, in some way relating to youth. So uh, I pursued it and uh, it's been everything that I was, I was hoping for and more. It's certainly challenging, but I continue to learn and I really enjoy uh, the volunteers I work with, the, uh, the board colleagues and others, uh, advisors, ambassadors, and so on, who are lending their time and their talents to helping us, including uh, a number of Yale alums, as I think you've seen. Are you from the New Haven area? I'm originally from Wyndham County, Connecticut, but I've been in New Haven on and off for more than 30 years now since my undergrad days. Was coming to Yale the first time you were living in New Haven? First time I was living in New Haven, yes. Okay, and what inspired this interest in being specifically helping out in the New Haven area? Well, um, when I was an undergrad, I was involved in Dwight Hall. I was a big brother to uh, a boy who lived in New Haven. So I did that for three years and I stayed in touch with him. Uh, and he now was a father and uh, so that's been rewarding. Um, and also when I was an undergrad, I had a summer job that you referred to with UConn Upward Bound that involved working with young people from around Connecticut, including from New Haven. So I had the chance to meet some high school students when I was a college student. Uh, and that was a very fulfilling summer job. And uh, I think also contributed to my wanting in some way to work uh, in New Haven and, uh, and with young people. And in the last several years, I've had the chance to reconnect with two of those then young people who are now grown men and fathers and husbands in their 40s. So that 
has also uh, you know, been uh, an extra rewarding aspect of this and makes me feel even more rooted in New Haven. I should say as well that now my wife and I met in New Haven uh, some years ago, and we have two kids who are now in the New Haven Public Schools, so that's an additional tie. So. Got it. Um, can you tell me a bit more about these relationships with these people you met in New Haven when you were an undergrad? Uh, well, I don't think I'd want to get into great detail, but uh, one of them, he was a uh, a young person who'd had significant family challenges. So um, I was identified as a potential so-called big brother and got to know him and to some extent his family. Uh, and it was a different era in terms of uh, Yale and the community in some ways, things were less formal. So you could bring a student, uh, you know, a young person from New Haven onto campus with you uh, in a way that now surely would not be so easily permitted, you know, for understandable concerns, liability reasons, and so on. Uh, so at that time, I was able to bring him into a residential college and that kind of thing. But uh, understandably, that is no longer the case. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, we've had the chance to reconnect, as I said, in recent years. And that has been uh, satisfying to see how he has grown up and now become a, a father himself, so. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, when you first connected with these people, or you said that you were the big brother to the boy who lived in New Haven, and then also separately, you were part of UConn Upward Bound in which you also were working with young people. Mm -hmm. um, for the first one, um, where you were talking to the boy who lived in New Haven, was that part of a specific program? Well, it was through Dwight Hall, and there was a program that at that time was called the Coordinating Council for Children in Crisis. They now have a different name. Uh, so they would match, there, there was a social worker who matched me and other Yale undergrads with some young people. Uh, so as I recall, there was another a Yale classmate of mine who was matched to the, another member of this family, for example. So, uh, I'm sure that through Dwight Hall, many similar such efforts continue to occur. The Upward Bound program, as you may know, is part of a federally funded effort that is at UConn and many other campuses around the country. Uh, so that provides uh, academic preparation as well as uh, residential experience on a college campus and recreational activities. So for that, uh, I stayed in the dorm and uh, help lead activities and was kind of a, a tutor as well academically. Uh, and as I say, two of those young people, one of them actually ended up uh, attending Yale himself. The other one went to UConn uh, and they're back here in New Haven, as I say, with uh, families of their own now. So. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and since you have become involved as the director of CASA Connecticut, obviously it's grown a lot over time, <coughs> um, just from starting off and now coming to where it is today. So I'd love to hear a bit more about how your view of CASA Connecticut and has changed over time and how your own role has fluctuated. Well, when we started up about two and a half years ago, we had no volunteers. I was the only staff person. And with the time, we had a startup board of just four people from National CASA because National CASA saw an opportunity here in Connecticut, an unmet need in terms of children who could benefit from these kinds of caring, consistent uh, and well-trained volunteer advocates. So uh, I went out during the course of you know, the second half of 2019, I had to get trained myself. So I had to undergo the CASA training. I had to uh, begin exploring funding opportunities, uh, connect with potential board members and so on. And I put together the materials to, uh, to be able to offer a training, you know, have application, uh, an application procedure and, and so on. Uh, so we did that with 
important support from National CASA, uh, among other colleagues, and had our first training in person at that time in December of 2019. Two years ago this week, we started. And I should say that Dwight Hall was an important partner in that. Dwight Hall, as well as the New Haven Public Library, uh, and then later the Jewish Community Center in Woodbridge helped provide space uh, for our training. So they were valuable partners. Uh, and then due to the pandemic, we had to move everything online. So we now have trainings that are uh, through an online platform and with uh, Zoom sessions. So it's a blended approach. And that has been effective. It took some learning on the part of everyone, but has allowed us to, to reach, I think, more volunteers from uh, different parts of the state without having to worry about their driving and meeting at a specific time. Uh, we also, of course, due to the pandemic, children and their families have uh, really faced additional adversity. So we've had to be sensitive to that. They've had difficulty visiting with uh, their social workers. And in, for in the cases of children who are in foster care, they've uh, had greater difficulty visiting with their own families. And our volunteers have also, while they normally would meet in person at least once a, once a month with children, they've had to, in some cases, uh, hold virtual meetings. But all of that under the circumstances uh, has gone relatively well, and uh, we continue to grow. I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that we're in the process of training our seventh cohort of volunteers. So we've now, to date, served uh, nearly 60 children uh, in New Haven, uh, that that's in the New Haven region, meaning uh, the Department of Children and Families offices in both New Haven and Milford that work with the New Haven Court for Child Protection. So uh, we're making a difference already, our volunteers, and uh, helping to identify services and resources for them and their families and helping to, uh, for the children in some cases to be reunified with their families or uh, get a, a longer term solution that uh, is preferable to foster care, like what is called transfer of guardianship, where in many cases, uh, some member of their extended kin will take them in. So I should also make clear, Sarah, that we are here in Connecticut working not only in foster care situations, but also what is known as protective supervision, where the idea uh, is that to the extent that it's safe and possible, the child will remain with their family instead of having to wind up in the foster care system. So our volunteers help support a child or sometimes groups of siblings with their own families, as well as in foster care situations. Got it. And do you still work as a volunteer yourself or have you stepped back from that direct capacity? Yeah, I've stepped back from that. In recent years, I've been uh, on the board of something called the Literacy Coalition of Greater New Haven. And we just uh, oversaw a kind of transition where that organization is being absorbed by and its resources are being absorbed by the United Way of Greater New Haven. So that has been satisfying as well to see after many years. And I do a little bit of volunteer basketball coaching. My son is an eighth grader. So I, I used to be more involved in that uh, when he was younger and, and various other tutoring and mentoring efforts. But at this point with this startup organization though I do now have a couple of staff colleagues that we've hired, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot. And uh, between that and, and my family, I don't wanna get overstretched. So. Got it. And when you did work as a volunteer originally, how was that experience for you? And then how was the experience transitioning from a more hands-on approach to a more administrative one? I would say I learned a lot from those volunteer experiences cumulatively, some of which were in New Haven. I mentioned the, the big brother role back in my undergrad years. The upward bound role was a, a summer, a staff summer job. I was paid for that. Uh, other volunteer roles included with uh, kids at a 
a couple of New Haven public schools and also when I lived in New York and in Cambridge I did some volunteering with kids who were uh, of public school age both elementary and high school age so I would say it, it gave me insights into academic and social emotional needs of children the wide range of uh, kids and their needs uh, certain developmental, you know, I guess you could say, uh, ages and stages needs of the, you know, children who are in elementary school versus those who are adolescents or approaching college, of course, have very different needs. And before I was a parent, it gave me some direct uh, familiarity with uh, the range of challenges and experiences that young people might have uh, and their families in different cities and settings. Uh, in terms of that direct experience versus um, being in a more administrative capacity and uh, at a startup like Connecticut Casa, it definitely informs my work. I think it it helps me uh, appreciate certain subtleties in interactions and experiences that uh, children and families and their volunteers in the case of CASA may have and their dealings with the child welfare system. But uh, it's also a constant reminder of how much I need to continue learning and the importance of being uh, respectful of all that you don't know and need to learn. So I, I try always to be open-minded about that. And I draw upon uh, people that I got to know in the New Haven Public Schools, some teachers and administrators over the years. Uh, I've had some occasion to connect volunteers to them and uh, all of the other nonprofit organizations in the Greater New Haven community. I mentioned the United Way, there's the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, uh, the Public Library in Dwight Hall and the JCC I mentioned. Uh, but there are so many others that uh, it's definitely you, you have the sense you are part of a community of professionals and volunteers and that you can introduce volunteers in CASA to this larger community uh, where they have some opportunity to, to make a contribution. Definitely. So currently, what are the parts of your work that you find the most fulfilling? Well, I wake up every day feeling busy, challenged, but that it's uh, it's fulfilling work, that anything I'm doing is contributing to the success of the organization, whether it's uh, interviewing a volunteer, talking with a board member, worrying about uh, the logistics of, you know, payroll, insurance, et cetera. Uh, there are some big picture and some uh, you know, more micro level logistical details you need to worry about. But uh, over time, from week to week, month to month, and now, as I was saying, year to year, you definitely see a progression uh, that we are going from having, you know, zero local board members, for example, to now we had nine board colleagues by the time CAS of Southern Connecticut joined Connecticut CASA, which had nine other board members. So we now have a board of 18 from around the state. We have these 12 advisors. We have uh, the seven cohorts of volunteers. And uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're serving children directly already in the New Haven area. And soon we expect to uh, announce an expansion uh, beyond to another court in Connecticut. That's not yet public information, but we expect in January to be able to announce that. So that reflects a, a further stage of growth. So, you know, in any one day, uh, I may only be working on a few of, uh, a few strands related to this, but as I mentioned, also having two new staff colleagues, uh, there's a way that, you know, we can multiply our, our impact and it isn't just up to, uh, a small number of volunteers and one staff person. Now it's you know we're we're multiplying the uh, the effect and and having kind of a catalytic role. I I would hope uh, with these terrific volunteers. Definitely. Um, after graduating from Yale, you're still quite connected with the institution. 
Um, it looks like you still serve as an associate fellow with Saybrook and you previously worked for the Yale New Haven Teachers Institute. And so what brought you to want to maintain ties with Yale in such a way? Well, I certainly enjoyed my undergrad experience. And then um, when I returned to New Haven in 2002, uh, my job involved working closely with Yale faculty members and the New Haven Public Schools. So through that work over the years, uh, I would say the ties deepened and I got to know more colleagues around the university and also uh, appreciated being invited by uh, a then uh, head of a college, uh, Mary Miller, who's a distinguished historian of art. She uh, invited me to become a fellow of Saybrook College, though I had been in Morris College uh, as an undergrad myself. And I've enjoyed that over the years. I've been doing that since the fall of 2008. So uh, every term I advise uh, a handful of, it, until recently it was just first year students. I'm now advising both first and second year students. And uh, despite the pandemic, uh, we've had some opportunity to, to stay in touch through Zoom and so on. I'm not able to get in and have lunch with uh, the students in Saybrook, but, uh, but that's been also uh, a valuable way to remain part of the Yale community and to see this new generation of people, your generation, and, and even a slightly earlier generation from 10, 12 years ago, uh, who were going out and uh, not just studying and learning on campus, but uh, themselves getting connected to the New Haven community. And uh, the Yale community is much more international than it was in my era, which is something that uh, has been a good thing for the institution and I think uh, broadens its, its connection to the world. So I've had a few international student advisees, uh, but mainly They've been from around the U.S. Uh, studying all kinds of different disciplines, but uh, certainly both benefiting from and contributing to the institution. How did your time at Yale impact your decision to be, or mm, I think you sort of already answered this on a broad scale, but are there any specific classes or experiences from Yale that you haven't mentioned yet that have shaped the way you work and think now, particularly within CASA? Uh, my, I, I studied history as an undergrad. I did take three economics classes and then later on ended up studying public policy in grad school where I took courses in areas such as nonprofit management as well as economic statistics. Uh, so that academic background both at Yale as an undergrad and in my graduate experience elsewhere certainly has been helpful. But uh, I would say the Dwight Hall connection when I was an undergrad was most salient in terms of uh, effects on what I'm doing now. That definitely was uh, important. Is CASA Connecticut still connected to Dwight Hall at Yale to this day? Do you still host your trainings affiliated with them? We have, because all of our trainings have been uh, virtual since that December 2019 one and, and a kind of a false start in March 2020 as the pandemic was beginning, uh, we have not had occasion to do anything physically, uh, you know, on campus or in Dwight Hall specifically. but. I remain in touch with uh, a couple folks there, and uh, I, as a, an alum, I'm a believer in Dwight Hall. I make modest personal contributions to Dwight Hall each year, and uh, I'm always uh, inspired by the, the, the next generation of young people who are coming through Yale, not just applying their, uh, their academic interests, but pursuing uh, social and public service uh, and, and activist interest through Dwight Hall. And how has your work at CASA influenced your perspective on past Yale experiences? Well, I think it's a, it's a constant reminder of how 
privileged uh, members of the Yale community are. That's something that I, I would hope that people are aware of already, do not take for granted, but um, anyone connected to Yale should appreciate the, the privilege there. And uh, if you're working with children in the child welfare system, which I'm doing indirectly, I'm not meeting the, the children or their families personally, though on occasion through a virtual hearing, and we have been holding our hearings uh, through Microsoft Teams, you will on occasion see a parent or hear the voice of a young person on the phone calling into a hearing. But with, the, with those exceptions, unlike the volunteers, I'm not personally talking with uh, the members of the, the families or the children who are in the child welfare systems, but I'm reading the confidential case files and you see some really troubling uh, experiences that uh, these kids are enduring. The opioid epidemic has uh, worsened these problems. There is uh, an awful lot of intimate partner violence. So it, it's very troubling to read all of this and uh, the contrast between what children, not just in New Haven, but throughout the region and of course throughout the country, because this is just the, the local iteration of uh, a CASA movement that deals with uh, experiences of abuse and neglect that that are far too common everywhere you know, around the country and of course around the world. So I think it is a reminder that uh, we who in some way are connected to the Yale community uh, have extraordinary opportunities, not just the wealth, but uh, good fortune in other ways. And we have uh, a responsibility to try to use those opportunities and resources to the extent possible to uh, to help those who you know, don't have those opportunities. And I have had occasion through this CASA work already to meet some terrific people uh, in different parts of the university who are doing important work. For example, Dr. Andrea Asnes, uh, who uh, specializes, she's a pediatrician who specializes in abuse and neglect cases, uh, that's spelled A-S-N-E-S. -E She'd be a good person to look up. Uh, there's a woman named Alice Rosenthal who is employed by the, uh, what's called the CCA or uh, Center for Children's Advocacy through a medical legal partnership. She has a connection to uh, Yale, uh, I think law school as well as the, the hospital uh, and she connected me to a, a Yale law student who initially was, a, when I met her a couple of years ago, was a 2L in her second year of law school. And both in that year and then last year in her third year of law school, and now as a Yale Law School alum, she as a volunteer is helping us to train new volunteers because she had experience in CASA in another state uh, before she came to the Yale Law School. Uh, and she is you know, giving her time to help us uh, train the, the new volunteers. So those are just two examples of uh, ways in which the, the many terrific people around the Yale community are helping us and, uh, you know, as they do professionally and as volunteers in many instances. And I do hope you have the chance to um, communicate with some of the individuals that I suggested who are among our board, our advisors, our volunteers, because uh, there are Yale alums and in some cases current Yale students from the School of Medicine who are uh, devoting their time and energy to, to serving children directly or to guiding us on the board or among our advisors and so on. Is there anything else related to these topics that you'd like me to know, but I haven't asked about yet? Well, the, uh, the point I made about both foster care and protective supervision is an important one, I think, that to the extent possible, we're trying to be part of a, a preventative movement so that children don't wind up in the foster care system in the first place. Uh, and if they do try to 
ensure that it's as, as brief as possible and that uh, they have a chance for timely permanency uh, and that we're part of a, a collaborative effort that CASA volunteers uh, work with professionals in many different capacities, teachers, social workers, judges, attorneys, medical professionals, that uh, there's, there's no way that a, a volunteer can uh, achieve very much on his or her own, that it's really up to uh, the, the whole team of volunteers. And that's something that the Connecticut Department of Children and Families Commissioner, Vanessa Durantes, uh, has emphasized that uh, there is a team of professionals and others and a CASA volunteer can be part of that team. And that's what we uh, strive toward. Definitely. And earlier you were talking about how you decided to get involved early on at Yale through Dwight Hall. Um, why specifically did you decide to become involved with those initiatives when you were an undergrad? Well, when I arrived on campus, um, it's now many years ago, over 30 years ago, I had had a summer job for the prior two years with Connecticut, actually three years with Connecticut PERG, a public interest research group. So uh, that, as you may know, is an environmental organization. So that was one of my primary interests. Uh, but I also had uh, an interest in learning more about education. I myself had uh, come to Yale with primarily a public school uh, background. And, and then for four years, I had gone to private school. And so I was interested in learning more about education in New Haven and beyond. So I, there was a, my first volunteer role through Dwight Hall, I believe was with something at, called Branch, which at the time was at Hill House High School. I think I did that in 88, 89, uh, before becoming a volunteer big brother in the spring of 89, if I recall, which was toward the end of my freshman year. So it's been many years, so some of the dates could be a bit fuzzy. Uh, but I, the Dwight Hall was uh, already then, and I'm sure even more now, uh, established uh, as a kind of a forum, you know, it, to connect young people from the university to different opportunities around the city. And uh, I found that it did that for me. The last question I have is, Cost Connecticut have plans to become more involved with Dwight Hall? So for example, like bringing people, bringing more Yale students in to become volunteers? Potentially, uh, I would be open to that. Our volunteers have to be at least 21 and they have to be able to make a commitment of typically 18 to 24 months. So it isn't for everyone, but uh, to the extent there are some undergraduates who are 21 and feel confident they can commit to being in New Haven for a couple of years, then it could work. Uh, certainly for the, the group of graduate and professional students who might be able to find the time, uh, as several already have, to, uh, to serve in this kind of volunteer role. I would be very open to that and, uh, and already have in mind staying in touch with colleagues at Dwight Hall about any such opportunities. Got it. I think that's the end of the questions that I have for now. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I don't think so. Just I'm um, curious if you managed to reach any of the, the others that I had CC'd, and if not, if you'd welcome my help in trying to track them down, because while I'm happy to talk and I welcome your, your interest and time, Sarah, uh, I know that uh, I'm the staff guy here, and it'd be useful if you could hear from some people who were volunteering their time, not you know in a professional capacity with CASA. Yeah, thank you so much for offering. I reached out yesterday and a lot of them have been very forthcoming and getting back to me. And so I think I'll be able to reach them individually with the questions for now. Okay, good. And do you have any sense of how soon the article might run? 
Yes. So my article will be edited on Thursday night, which means it will likely be published by Friday or Saturday. Okay, great. Well, uh, I, again, really appreciate your and the, the YDN's interest. And uh, let me know if you have any follow-up questions that may occur to you based on this conversation or on your communications with the others that we talked about. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your help. Okay, sure. And if this video uh, proves useful to you, it may also turn out to be something that would be useful to CASA. I don't know. I don't know how the edited product will come out, but uh, if you're comfortable sharing it, it's possible that it would be something that'd be useful on our end as well. So, you know, that's not certainly something I would uh, insist on, but just uh, something you might consider. Yeah, I'm not sure we'll be publishing the video of this. It's more for transcription purposes. Oh, I'm not suggesting you publish the video. It's, well, it possibly would have some uh, documentary benefit on our end as well. I don't know. But uh, in general, I'm just uh, appreciative to have had the opportunity to talk with you. Yeah, I can definitely send you the recording afterwards if you want it for purposes of documentation. Okay. Yeah, that can't hurt. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to me again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Hope you feel better. Thank Get you. over that cold. Thank you.